I now hand the conference over to Mr. Abhinandan Singh, Head Investor Relations and M&A at GoForge Limited. Thank you and over to you, Mr. Singh. A warm welcome to all of you to the Q4 FY21 earnings conference call of GoForge. Uh, you'd have received our results by now. Those are also available on our website, www.coforgetech.com. Present along with me on this call are our CEO, Mr. Sudhir Singh, and our CFO, Mr. Ajay Kalra. We will start this forum with opening remarks from our CEO, and post that, we will open the floor for your questions. With that, I would now like to hand over the floor to Mr. Sudhir Singh, our CEO. Over to you, Sudhir. Thank you, Avi. And a very good evening and a very good morning to you across the world, folks. At the outset, let me state that I hope your families, your loved ones, and you yourselves are safe and healthy. These are trying times for the world, and particularly for those of you who joined us from India. We deeply appreciate your taking the time and joining us for the conversation today. With that, I shall now share perspectives around our quarterly and annual results and our outlook going forward. We are very pleased to share that the quarter that just closed, quarter four, has been a strong growth quarter for the firm. We are equally pleased to state that for the full year gone by, we have delivered on both our growth and margin guidance. Before I jump into an analysis of our quarter four results, I would like to highlight the very strong operating markers that have characterized our Q4 performance. Robust hiring with direct headcount up almost 9% quarter on quarter. Continued deal wins with two significant deals secured and very strong cash flow with an OCF of $44 million, which is 144% of EBITDA. We are pleased to report that during the quarter under review, quarter four fiscal year 21, in dollar terms, our consolidated revenue grew by 7.1% quarter on quarter. The US dollar 172.1 million. In reported terms, revenue increased 6% quarter on quarter to Indian rupees 12,615 million. In constant currency terms, our revenue grew 5.1% quarter over quarter. During the quarter under review, our largest vertical insurance grew 4.9% quarter on quarter. Insurance revenues represented 31.2% of the quarter's revenue. After two consecutive quarters of 5.4% and 9.8% sequential growth, the travel vertical recorded a growth of 0.2% this quarter. The travel business contributed to 18.9% of Q4 revenues. Our BFS business, after recording three quarters of sequential growth of 6.2%, 6.5%, and 7.7% in the last three quarters, degrew by 4.6% sequentially in quarter four and contributed 16.8% of the firm's quarterly revenue. We expect BFS to rebound very strongly in Q1. Other verticals, including retail, manufacturing, government outside India, healthcare, and high tech, collectively expanded 17.6% quarter on quarter, fueled by strong growth for our cloud, digital integration, and intelligent automation services. Our top five clients grew 10.1% quarter on quarter, and our top 10 clients grew 13.2% quarter on quarter. Our top five clients contribute to 25.4% of our total revenue, and our top 10 clients contribute contributed 36.5% of the total revenue. In order to ensure sustained and predictable growth, we have always de-emphasized reliance on any single client. These numbers that I just shared with you around client concentration are in line with our intent to create a de-risked operating model, which in turn delivers robust, predictable, profitable growth for the longer term. 
On-site revenues represented 61% of total revenues in quarter four fiscal year 21. This indicates a gradual rise in offshore over the past three quarters, with on-site revenues at 61% now, being lower than 62% required, recorded in quarter three and 64% recorded in quarter two. I shall now move on to the margins and the operating profits for quarter four. During quarter four, we delivered an EBITDA of Indian rupees 2,268 million. This was before accounting for RSU costs and the part of the SLK global acquisition related expenses booked during the quarter. EBITDA margin for the quarter stands at 18%. As indicated when I spoke to you in January, we distributed a broad-based one-time bonus during the quarter for more than 85% of our employees who have provided extraordinary support to our operations and business during the pandemic. We had also instituted selective wage hikes in quarter three for niche skill holders. Our EBITDA margin for Q4 reflects the impact of these distributions. The effective tax rate for quarter four was 22.9% of PBT. Our net after-tax profits for the quarter increased by 9% over the last quarter to Indian rupees 1,330 million, implying a net margin of 10.5%. I shall move on, switch over to the annual results now. The financial year of fiscal year 2021 has been an unusually difficult year for all businesses. But for CoForge, which has historically had one of the highest exposures within its peer set to the travel, transportation, and hospitality industry, the challenges were severely amplified. This is reflected in the change in the share of our revenues from the travel industry, which contributed 19% to total revenues in fiscal year 21, compared to 28% in fiscal year 20. Consolidated revenue for the full year for CoForge fiscal year 21 grew 11.5% over last year to Indian rupees 46,628 million. In constant currency terms, growth for the year was 6%, which you will recall is in line with what we had indicated earlier. I believe it is extremely important to note that the growth excluding the travel vertical for the firm in a pandemic infused year has been 18.4% in CC terms. Our insurance business grew 12.8% in CC terms in fiscal year 21 over fiscal year 20. It now contributes to 32.5% of the total revenue. Our BFS business grew 14.6% in CC terms in FY21 over FY20 and now contributes to 17.4% of total revenue. You will notice financial services is now approaching 60% of our aggregate revenues. Travel and transport was down 26.9% in CC terms in FI21 over FI20. It now contributes only 19.3% to total revenues. Other businesses, including retail, manufacturing, government outside India, healthcare, and high-tech collectively grew 28.2% year-on-year in CC terms, and they now represent 30.8% of overall revenues. Starting next quarter, we will start offering revenue and margin data around these verticals as well. The geo-based growth cuts also showed sustained growth. America's which contributes to 48% of our global revenues, grew by 6.1% in CC terms. EMEA revenues grew 3.3% year-on-year in CC terms, and they now represent 37% of the revenue mix. The rest of the world grew 12.3% in CC terms during the year and contributed 15% to the total revenue. The digital and the product engineering portfolio of the firm constitutes 52.1% of the firm's revenue. This excludes revenue from our cloud services business. The digital and the product engineering portfolio grew 9.6% in FI21 over FI20. 
The significant growth in revenue was accompanied by an uptick in operating profits as well during the year. EBITDA, before ESOP and acquisition-related costs, increased by 16.3% during the year and stands at rupees 8,391 million, translating into an EBITDA margin of 18% for the year. Finally, our net profits for the year stood at rupees 4,556 million, implying a net margin of 9.8%. The effective tax rate for the year stood at 21.8% of the PBT. That, ladies and gentlemen, rounds off the revenue and the profits analysis for Q4 and the full year. Moving on to order intake, we secured fresh business of US dollars 201 million during the quarter. Out of this 201 million order intake, the US contributed 119 million dollars, EMEA contributed 65 million dollars, and we secured 17 million dollars from the rest of the world. The cumulative order intake across fiscal year 21 was $781 million. The order book executable over the next 12 months has expanded and now stands at US dollars $520 million. The robust intake was enabled by and sustained by deal signing momentum. We signed two significant deals in quarter one. Both of these were in the travel vertical. We also added 11 new customers during the quarter. I believe a key and a very welcome shift in FY21 in large deal complexion for the firm has been the increased ticket size of the large deals closed or currently being pursued. In quarter three, you will recall we had shared that we had closed a $45 million TCB deal with a new logo in insurance. At this stage, the firm is pursuing three greater than $50 million TCV deals, out of which one is a $100 million plus TCV deal. Importantly and incidentally, these three pursuits are not renewals. The other important shift in FI21 has been in the qualitative change in the client roster of the firm. As shared earlier, Accelerated growth going into FY22 shall also be driven by the fact that the firm has become impaneled as a preferred tech services partner across multiple Fortune 100 and Fortune 500 insurance and BFS clients. I shall move on now to the section around delivery operations, capability build, and offer some flavor around key events recorded. From a capability and a service line perspective, CoForge today, as it stands as a firm, is a composite of a $100 million product engineering service line, a $100 million cloud services business, which is focused on driving engineering convergence, a $100 million automation, intelligent automation service line, and a $50 million enterprise integration service line we see strong demand for each of these capabilities. And that is expected to underpin our growth story in the months, quarters, and years to come. A key component of our product engineering offering is the Advantage Go business. Advantage Go is now acknowledged as a core insurance software player. Investments made over the past three years with products and their roadmaps fully aligned to provide higher value to the customer through valuable core product version upgrades have enabled us to capture the market for pre-bind underwriting software. During the quarter, one of the world's preeminent specialty risk organizations went live with our underwriting product. And we have received very positive feedback from the business users on the application stability and the performance. We also successfully completed discovery phases for two large underwriting programs at a Fortune 100 and a Fortune 500 insurance carrier. Recently, the Exact Max solution, which is Advantage Go's powerful reinsurance exposure management solution, was tested for its capability to process a load of 2 billion 
location data points, which demonstrates its capability to assess locations for predicting potential loss or exposure. I mean, illustratively, for example, hurricane path or flood damage to an area may involve many insured locations. While exact, the earlier version, can process millions, exact max can process billions in terms of data volume and is targeted at reinsurers who insure multiple insurance companies and therefore need this high volume capability. Beyond product engineering in the cloud and the infrastructure space, which is already, as I said, a very significant part of our overall business and our future growth strategy, we have strengthened our infra as a core practice and developed more than 50 use cases for single click migrations or environment rollouts in the cloud, helping our customers with multi-fold improvement in time to market while reducing costs. We are also leveraging our capabilities across cloud, digital, and vertical business lines to introduce full stack industrialized cloud solutions and develop industry specific transformation use cases. For a BFS client in North America, CoForge completed an end-to-end -end infrastructure as a core solution from scratch, delivering a single click infra, infra provisioning and configuration management that includes the middleware app, database, and third-party software on Azure. At the same time, recognizing that a multi-cloud infrastructure might offer the best return on investment for many customers because it de-risks vendor lock-in, and as we know, it leverages best of weak capabilities across hyperscalers. We have also been investing in accordingly reskilling our employees. Today, 50% of our cloud and infra resources are already multi-cloud certified, and this number is set to keep growing with speed. CoForge has also created an AI ops platform for the cloud space, which combines AI and automation with programmable infrastructure that provides our customers a built-in capability for multi-cloud management. In one of the significant deals we won during the quarter under review, we signed a full-scale IT outsourcing deal, and our AI ops platform and our cloud and DevOps capabilities were the key differentiators that helped us secure that one. Our technology innovations include a game-changing cloud hyperscaler innovation for insurance in which we are leveraging our AI ops platform-driven capabilities to deliver rapid business outcomes to our insurance clients, along with expediting the journey to the cloud. This helps insurers reimagine how they can buy, consume, and innovate in a multi-cloud world while accentuating security and reliability, and as a result, further enhances our positioning in this space. For a client in the BFS space in Europe, CoForge deployed three environments in AWS in a fully automated manner, enabling the customer to onboard new and existing business workflows quickly based on their customer needs. In an interesting convergence of emerging technologies for a large bank, we built, and this is in North America, we built an Azure-based advanced data analytics platform. It uses Azure machine learning and offers deep insights and dashboards to help monitor banking operations. We have also built recommendation systems to deploy suitable products to this bank's customers and designed a risk profile engine to help predict defaults. Finally, we also signed a very large digital transformation initiative with one of the world's largest travel tech organizations. This will support their vision of application transformation to next-gen platform with the Google cloud environment. With that, and this quarter, you would have noticed I focused only on product engineering and cloud services. I will move on to the people section. We registered the highest ever quarterly people addition in our firm's history during quarter four, with a net increase of 967 people in our headcount. This represents an 8.8% increase in net headcount quarter on quarter, and a 9% sequential increase in production headcount. Total headcount at the end of the quarter was 12,391. In quarter one fiscal year 22, and we are in the middle of it right now, we expect to increase net headcount by around another 1,000 employees. This employee addition is in line with the order bookings, the deal momentum, 
as well as the demand environment that we are seeing. We believe strongly that unless hiring is done upfront and unless attrition is scaled, firms will struggle to fulfill demand out there. Utilization during the quarter increased to 81%. Our attrition, and we take particular pride in this, and you would have always noticed it, remained stable at 10.5% and continues to be one of the lowest in the industry, possibly the lowest. For us, sustained low employee attrition levels reflect a highly engaged and committed employee base. That in turn creates value and deeper relationships with clients and helps at times like these. Our annual client satisfaction net promoter score this year during the pandemic were again the highest ever in the history of the firm. As noted earlier in the presentation in quarter four, we distributed a broad-based one-time bonus during the quarter for more than 85% of our employees. This came on the back of selective wage hikes in quarter three for niche skill holders. Effective April 1 of the current year, annual wage hikes have already been rolled out. Key balance sheet, uh, balance sheet metrics. Next. Cash bank balances stood at Indian rupees 8,391 million, which is an increase of Indian rupees 3,026 million over the previous quarter. CapEx spend during the quarter was Indian rupees 127 million. Debtors at the end of the quarter stood at 70 days of sales outstanding. OCF to EBITDA fiscal year 21 stands at 80%. We are pleased to share that in line with our intent to return excess cash generated to shareholders, the board has recommended an interim dividend of rupees 13 per share. Quick commentary on the hedge positions. Outstanding hedges in USD are US dollar 74.69 million at an average rate of Indian rupees 76.95 to the US dollar. In British pounds, we have 21.81 million outstanding, and that's at Indian rupees 100.92 to the pound. In euro, it is 4.54 million at Indian rupees 91.08 to a euro. And in Australian dollars, it is 4.11 million at Indian rupees 56.24 to the AUD. Quick note around the subsidiary information before I move on to outlook. For advantage growth, the revenue for the quarter was Indian rupees 855 million. EBITDA was 31%. For Wishworks, the revenue for the quarter was Indian rupees 1005 million. EBITDA was 24%. As you're aware, last month we added a new subsidiary, SLK Global Solutions, where we have acquired a controlling stake. SLP Global Solutions is a business process transformation enterprise offering DPM and digital solutions for the financial services industry, and it is a quasi-captive for the Fifth Third Bank. Fifth Third Bank, incidentally, has become a top five client for CoForge post-consolidation. The first close, closing involving two tranches to get up to 60% equity stake has been concluded. Accordingly, CoForge now owns 60%, while Fifth Third Bank continues to own 40% in the business. The business will contribute about 11 months of its fiscal year 22 performance into CoForge's fiscal year 22 consolidated financials. I want to state, I suspect restate that we are very excited about this acquisition. We believe this transaction represents significant value creation for both organizations because of five key reasons. One, it is a quasi-captive with a five-year minimum revenue commitment. Two, straight off the bat, it has created a top five global client for us in a core vertical. Three, it is margin accretive. Four, it is a high-growth firm with a three-year revenue tagger of 17% and a proven execution-oriented tenured management team, which has driven that performance and continues to stay with the firm. And five, we have secured this at a reasonable enterprise valuation at a single-digit EBITDA multiple. Those were the five reasons. 
the integration process over the last three weeks has been progressing as per plan. We already have two joint bids that have been submitted. Finally, the last section before I conclude, outlook. We are planning for significant growth and material margin expansion in fiscal year 22. The recent SLK Global acquisition has created a significant inorganic growth component for the firm in FY22. Hence, we are sharing our organic revenue and margin plans for FY22. Given the exit ramp, which the 7.1% sequential growth dollar terms blocked in Q4 has created, the large deals pipeline that we are addressing, and the locked-in 12-month order executable number we, have, we walked into FI22 with, we are planning for at least 17% organic CC growth in FI22. In FI22, we intend to expand the EBITDA margin of our organic business to 19% from the current 18% recorded in FI21. This expansion will be driven by the reversal of the travel business discounts offered in FY21, by the operating leverage from the at least 17% growth that I talked about, and from increased offshoring. You've already seen that trend around offshoring. We expect SLK Global to clock both a higher rate of growth as well as register a higher EBITDA than the organic business. Finally, to conclude, over the last 15 quarters, our firm and our teams have delivered against revenue and profit plan in every quarter with no exceptions and with no surprises. That 15 quarter record, particularly our performance during the current pandemic hit year, despite our historical exposure to the travel industry, is a demonstration of that commitment. We remain hyper-focused on execution and committed to meeting and then exceeding our plans. With that, ladies and gentlemen, I come to the end of my opening remarks, and I look forward to hearing your comments and addressing your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will now begin with a question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on the touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Anyone who would like to ask a question, please press star and one at this time. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. The first question is from the line of Vibho Singhal from Philip Capital. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, good afternoon. Uh, uh, hello, sir. Thanks for taking my question and congrats on a great set of performance yet again. Uh, so, uh, so, we just a couple of questions from my side. Uh, just wanted a bit of color on the travel vertical again. Uh, so you mentioned that it is now just 19% of our revenues, but are we seeing any green shoots uh, in terms of the recovery in the travel? Uh, demand across uh, the, the globe in terms of our clients looking to increase their spend and we uh, there basically uh, uh, that vertical probably uh, growing, if not let's say in the first half, but at least in the second half of FI22. Uh, and secondly, my question is on the uh, margins front. Uh, you have added that 19% of the margins is what we are looking for, the organic business growth. Uh, and as uh, we understand SLK Global has a higher margin than our uh, core business. So the overall margin profile of the company will, of course, be north of 19%. In the organic business, uh, uh, just wanted to check, uh, given that we are looking for salary hike, and uh, also we are all looking, may, there might be some travel costs coming back, uh, maybe in the later part of the year. Uh, what are the uh, levers that you think uh, we, believe we could help uh, maintain those margins at 19% levels that we have added to? Thank you for the question, Vivo. Let me take them in order, and I'll try to make sure that I provide you a detailed answer around travel because I suspect that's a question that a lot of people have. I will then get to the margins question that you had around why we feel confident that that is the minimum that we will deliver. 
So specifically, let me just start off with uh, a broad sweep around the travel industry and what we're seeing out here. Now, with a, after about 15 months of continuously fighting this virus, the travel industry, we believe, is looking to rebuild and reemerge. If you look at just pure data, and I'm going to talk about the segments within travel, right? If you look at airlines, IATA estimates that travel will recover to 43% of 2019 levels this year, calendar year. And that's a 26% improvement over 2020. Overall passenger numbers that are being talked about is about 2.4 billion in 2021, and that's roughly going to be about a 33% increase over a 520. As the vaccination rollout increases, the general estimation is travel and hospitality sectors are going to see one of the biggest surges in quarter three and quarter four. And when I see quarter three, quarter four, I mean quarter three, quarter four in fiscal year terms. So that's effectively holiday season, October, December, and thereafter. If I move on beyond airlines to the hospitality industry, if you look at metrics from the American Hotel and Lodging Association, for example, they believe that uh, hotel occupancy in the U.S. is going to increase from 44% to 52% in 2021, and then maybe to 61%. That's their estimate in 2022 which incidentally is still going to be below the 2019 level of 66%. What we are seeing, interestingly, is the adoption of new protocols to comply with safety measures and significant investment in digital. And the focus is on high-tech, low-touch solutions using smartphones illustratively. Hospitality, interestingly, traditional casino operators, they've they're moving very aggressively, making a boatload of investments when it comes to online gaming and sports betting, etc. The broader theme that we're seeing across travel is that uh, travel clients are accelerating movement to cloud and they are investing in cybersecurity. On those lines, so one of the top five airlines in the world uh, this quarter, one of the deals, the large deals that I talked about, we've consolidated cybersecurity operations across multiple off course of theirs. And we are building a VAPT testing center of operations for them. We believe overall that most of our customers are already out of the bottom of the cycle. They are seeing neutral to positive cash flows over the next three to six months. The pandemic did over the last 15 months cause travel enterprises to revisit their cost structures and to use this period for implementing cost containment initiatives wherever possible to restore health. At CoForge, and you've seen this, the last two quarters, Q2 and Q3, we saw sequential growth of roughly about 7%. FY22, we expect our travel vertical, our travel business to be one of the fastest growing businesses in light of the commentary that I just gave you across the organization. You would also have noticed that the two large deals, significant deals that we talked about in this quarter, were both interestingly from the travel vertical. One of them was centered around cybersecurity and security service line operations. The other one was a very interesting deal where the airline took out all other all their existing vendors and consolidated all their IT outsourcing spends with us. So that we bore, uh, was a somewhat detailed answer to your first question. The second question that you had was margin guidance of 19%, what makes us confident that 19% confident is a number that we will deliver in a year in which salary costs are likely to be higher and competition for talent is definitely going to be acute. Three levers, as I would put it here. The first is, given the specific circumstances of CoForge, we are going to get, and we've already it. We are going to get a significant fillip in our margins because of the travel industry discounts that were offered last year getting reversed in FI22. That's one. Number two, it will come straight off from the growth leverage. And I've talked about the fact that at least we will grow 17% CC organic core business. SLK shall grow more. And the third uh, lever for us, and you've seen that play out in the last two or three quarters, is Given the given the complexion of the large deals that we are pursuing, we expect offshoring numbers to increase, to sustain and increase, uh, and that again is going to be going to have a positive impact on uh, our bottom line. 
So travel down discount reversal, growth leverage, increased offshoring will more than compensate for the salary increases that are likely to come in and are already actually in play within the organization. Those are the two answers that I can offer the board. Uh, sure, thank you so much for the detailed answer. Just one small more point on the travel segment. As you uh, elaborately explained about how the segment is feeling right now, uh, what is our experience in terms of uh, the overall inquiry level? I know you mentioned we won two large years in this quarter, but I mean, uh, apart from that, of course, also, are we seeing clients looking to spend more? Are we seeing new clients uh, jumping onto the, uh, the, let's say, the cloud migration or more of an automation or high tech spend uh, bandwagon? Uh, uh, I mean, if you were to quantify or let's say even take a subjective look, are we seeing more and more inquiries and interest about more extending the travel segment from the client? We are seeing significant, I would say not just some, significant inquiries around cloud-centric uh, deals, significant inquiries around security, especially given the low-touch, high-tech ecosystem that's getting uh, created around travel right now. And that's getting reflected. You would have seen that in travel vertical growth numbers and in the large deal conversions that have happened and the large deal conversations that are still happening. Thank you. We seem to answer the question, Yeah. Yes, sir. We actually lost this line. Before we move to the next question, we would like to request participants to please limit your question to one at a time. Should you have a follow-up question, we would request you to rejoin the queue. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Abhishek Shindasar from Ilara Capital. Please go ahead. Hi, sir. Thanks for the opportunity and uh, congratulations on great execution. Uh, I just have uh, you know two questions. One. Uh, is uh, can you just give us a color in terms of uh, you know the other verticals and the growth expected next year? I think that's sizable. Uh, so when can we expect the breakup of that? And second uh, is on the EBITDA margin uh, EBIT uh, transition for this year and next year. So one is last quarter we had said that the RSU charge will be 60 basis points next year. So is there any change uh, to that? And second thing is um, uh, post the integration of acquisition uh, from the EBITDA number to EBIT number, is there a material difference in the depreciation number from you know, for us as well as for uh, for the acquisition? Uh, that could be helpful, sir. Thank you, Abhishek. Uh, I'm going to request our CFO. Uh, I'm going to answer the questions in order. I'll talk about the other verticals and the um, RSU charges, and I'm going to request our CFO, Mr. Kalda, to address your EBITDA to EBIT, EBIT work that you asked about. So starting with the first question around other verticals, uh, at this point in time, uh, retail... Uh, so let me just start off by saying that uh, next quarter onwards, we will start offering vertical buys breakups of revenue, uh, cuts for everyone. At this point in time, retail and healthcare, Retail healthcare pharma is roughly about 10% of our aggregate global revenues. High tech and manufacturing, which is how we run it, is roughly about 8% of our aggregate global revenues. And government outside India, not India, government outside India, which is where there's significant amount of demand for both automation and integration services, is slightly more than 7% of our revenues. Next quarter onwards, we will make sure that we start offering you more structured cuts around this. As far as the uh, uh, the ESOP management incentive plan linked RSU charges, uh, they will go down uh, in line with what we discussed earlier. They should be going down about 40 to 50 bits over the over over FI21 and FI22. Uh, the third question that you had around the EBITDA to EBIT walk, Ajay, can I request you to take that, please? So sure, thank you, thank you, Sudhir. Uh, for uh, for the uh, target, uh, the uh, the depreciation uh, is approximately four and a half million dollars. That that that's what that will come. Uh, they do not have any debt, so no interest cost uh, is is there. So that that that's the broad walk between the bid and the bid there for the target. Uh, thank you and. Uh, yeah, and just uh, there are no other RSU or typical charges uh, for the acquisition, right? 
and that is correct uh, no no existing uh, charges uh, for the acquisition that is correct uh thank you sir for taking my question and best wishes for fy22 thank you abhishek over to you thank you the next question is from the line of sandeep shah from equiris please go ahead yeah uh, thanks for the opportunity and uh, congratulations on excellent performance across almost all the buckets as a whole uh, so we just wanted to understand uh, it's happening to see your large deal pipeline with average ticket size going up so what is driving is it the uh, connects with the advisor or is it our sizable uh, increase in some of the digital pillars which is driving as a whole and we believe this may be sporadic or this may continue going forward and are you factoring uh, because there are three deals above 50 million one above 100 million uh, any of these in your guidance in the uh, 17% or it may provide a positive surprise to the guidance hi sandeep yeah let me let me answer that question large deal pipeline and the average size of the deals uh, that we are approaching has clearly gone up uh, the 45 million dollar large uh, large deal with a new logo starting off with it uh, starting off with it in quarter 3 was indicative of it uh my belief is uh, it's really uh, the ability to scale up the conversations is driven by the capabilities that take time to build and are now being built uh the fact that the industry consulting service line which leads a lot of these conversations and stitches the solutions together has stabilized under a leader who's been with us now for 3 years the fact that the technology consulting service line has developed and has scaled up to the extent that it has and can contribute to that solution creation the fact that the sales engine continues we believe to be best in class and the, they are fantastic ambassadors of the organization and the fact that you now have multiple digital service lines under a person who's now been leading it for more than 3 years for us at the helm is what is allowing us to a engage upstream b leverage the larger advisor analyst ecosystem to get more more trades right at the outset and c construct solutions at the intersection of process knowledge and technology knowledge that allows us to differentiate and allows us to win at this point in time uh, as far as your question around uh, around the guidance is built as i said 17% is the is the at least growth number that we've offered uh, if if all of them were to translate and were to be one uh, there would obviously logically be an upside there uh, the way we looked at uh, we looked at planning our numbers is as you can imagine the intent is to be conservative and the intent is not to bake in all of them getting one uh, if all do get converted and that's an if there will be upsides but for now only some have been baked into the guidance that we have offered you did i answer your question sandeep yeah 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 very much uh, just few things uh, in terms of margins uh, this pricing reversal from the travel accounts will it come starting from 1q of fy22 itself and in 1q also you will have a non recurring uh, uh, bonus payment which you might have done in the 4q which will not repeat in 1q so these two factors will help you to actually mitigate some of the wage inflation uh, which you uh, plan in the 1q fy22 as a whole and uh, sudhir with sizable acquisition and robust free cash flow generation any uh, strategy or policy in terms of payout Uh, which you want to uh, or this should be to shareholders on a year over year basis sure uh, sandeep uh the uh, the the salary the salary increases that have been done uh normally have a delta negative of about 250 bits given the clutch of three factors that i talked about including the travel discount reversal we believe it should get contained to only 100 bits uh and of course with the increased offshoring as well that's coming into play so the margin impact positive impact in terms of buffering the salary cost implication will start getting reflected from quarter 1 itself uh, as far as the payouts are concerned uh the one time payouts are behind us now 
the salary increase was already instituted effective 1st of April of this year. There are no other one-time payouts that are proposed or planned or will be instituted going forward. I hope I answered your question, Sandeep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, I had a question on shareholders payout uh, actually. Hello. Yes, and if go ahead your question. Yeah, no, no. What I'm asking is uh, the question was also on the shareholders payout, uh, the cash distribution policy going forward with the sizable acquisition payment also being due. So, Sudhir, if you can throw some light on this. Here. Ladies and gentlemen, we lost the line of Mr. Sudhir Singh. I would request you to please stay connected while we join him back to the call. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for patiently waiting. We have Mrs. Singh reconnected. I would request Mrs. Sandeep Shah to please repeat your question. Yeah. Uh, so no, I, think uh, I, I do have the I, I do have your question, uh, Sandeep. My apologies for having got dropped off. Uh, it's it's my apologies. It's about three o'clock in the morning in the US. Uh, no, no so, issue at all. <laughs> so as far as the payouts are concerned, uh, it, it continues to be a board decision, Sandeep. But uh, the board has shared with the management that uh, the uh, that uh, the intent from a capital allocation perspective remains that we will we will attempt to return excess cash back to shareholders in line with the 13 rupee dividend that's been declared this time around. Okay, okay, thanks. Thanks and all the best. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Dipesh Mehta from MK Global. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity and congratulations on very strong execution. A couple of questions. First about the growth pattern. Typically, we have some seasonality in Q1 because of his work and uh, our insurance product related seasonality. Do you think it, that kind of seasonality will play out or you think there are enough uh, traction in the business which will take care of a uh, couple of pocket of seasonality kind of thing? Uh, second question about the SLK global integration. So, four and a half million, which earlier you indicated, it include amortization charges also. It is or it is only depreciation on the book of SLK, which we refer to. And uh, because of SLK, any change in your effective tax rate which you envisage? Thank you. Thank you, Dipesh. Uh, I'll answer the first question. Uh, the second and the third question. Uh, around the amortization, depreciation implications, and ETR, I'll request Ajay to step in. Let me take the first question first. Uh, uh, we've just closed the quarter with 7.1% dollar sequential growth, 5.1% CC sequential growth. Uh, quarter one, uh, the demand profile, as I shared with you, is good. It is solid and stable. We are not planning to, we are not planning for great growth in H1 and tepid growth in, uh, sorry, great growth in H2 and tepid growth in H1. We expect the growth to be a good steady ramp. H1 by itself should be strong given the demand that we see, given the supply pool that we've already created with our hiring. Q1, Q2, I mean, it's difficult to figure out on a quarterly basis what the number might land up being. Q1 should be a good quarter. H1 as an aggregate should be a strong H1 is what I can offer at this point in time. Ajay, would you like to step in and answer the patient's question around SLK? Sure. Uh, thank you, Sudhir. Uh, on the depreciation, uh, the four and a half million dollars, which I mentioned about the depreciation for SLK, uh, it, it is the depreciation on their books and it includes the cost of right of use of assets. However, it does not include the amortization of intangibles that will be 
uh, on Kofosh books as part of the purchase price allocation uh, uh, study that, that we will do. On the ETR, uh, the SLK Global ETR is higher than the Coforge ETR by a couple of hundred basis points. Uh, Deepesh, those are the two questions that, that I noted. Uh, uh, did I answer your question? No, so my question is, uh, so what kind of amortization charges one should expect considering uh, integration for 11 months on Coforge book? And uh, related is about ETR, how much, let's say right now we are at around 20 to 23. Do you expect it to shift or 20 to 23 is a good range? Uh, so, uh, Dipesh, as, as I uh, mentioned earlier as well, we are in the process of doing the purchase price allocation uh, of for the uh, in, uh, uh, SLK Global. And we will come with the actual numbers by our, in our quarter one results as we will uh, start doing the consolidation. At this moment, we are in the process of doing the study, and I would not uh, uh, give any guidance on, on what the amortization number on the Coach books would be. Uh, on the ETR, uh, as I mentioned, that it is 200 basis point uh, uh, higher than than. Uh, what uh, CoForge ETR is, so we expect that uh, to give an uptick of uh, uh, 20, 30 bits uh, because of that on the consolidated ETR. Understand, but overall considering whatever I think once you have studied done, but your EPS would be accretive for year one or you think transaction itself would, won't be EPS accretive because of amortization charges? So uh, uh, the way I will answer that question, Dipesh, is that our uh, uh, profit after tax margin would uh, marginally increase from uh, FY20 uh, in FY22. So uh, that to that extent, there will be an, uh, they will be higher than than what they were in FY20 to uh, 20 after considering the amortization of the CoForge uh, uh, amortization of intangibles. Understand. Thank you. Thanks for answering my question. Sorry, um, uh, Dipesh, just just correction. It is FY twenty one, not FY twenty two. So uh, uh, twenty. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Manik Taneja from JM Financial. Please go ahead. Hi. Thank you for the opportunity and congratulations for the great execution. Uh, so we basically just wanted to get your thoughts on a couple of things. Number one is that given the demand strength and given the supply side constraints that everybody in the industry is facing, do you envisage a case wherein it may be possible to push customers for higher offshore pricing? That's question number one. And the second thing is that uh, given the uh, second wave of COVID-19 here in India, do you see any near-term demand fulfillment issues for either you or the industry? Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you for the uh, question, uh, Vanek. Uh, pricing uh, is stable at this point in time, given the fact that uh, demand seems to be outstripping supply for the industry at a macro level. There are clear opportunities to ask for a price premium, uh, depending on the SME mix and the solution offering that goes into the market. That is how I, I would characterize Pricing, uh, pricing at the current point in time. Uh, as far as uh, as far as supply fulfillment is concerned, at an industry level, it is clearly going to be an issue. Uh, given given the demand that we see, and given the fact that operations during a pandemic tend to get uh, restricted and constricted, at our end, what we've done, and you would have seen this, uh, we've almost increased our production headcount by close to 10% in Q4. We are already almost in the middle of Q1, and the intent is to try to increase it by another 10%. Uh, we recognize, and I believe we called it out a couple of quarters back in an investor call, that there was going to be a supply crunch, uh, and that two things were important. One, that attrition needed to be contained, and there's a very big difference between a 10% attrition and a 20% attrition. And second, that one needed to make sure that as far as talent supply was concerned, one onboarded people with speed, even if it impacted margins temporarily. Now in five months, our production headcount, and by five months, I mean by the end of May this month, 
our production headcount should go up by at least 20% over where it was on the 1st of January. Uh, to that second, our attrition continues to be at 10.5%. And as you can imagine, we will move heaven and earth to make sure that it stays the lowest in the industry so that to that extent, we don't have to go and backfill for attrition. Uh, at this point in time, I feel very confident given the fact that the TA function and the revenue assurance function, I believe, at CoForge has done a fantastic job of hiring. A 20% increase in a firm's headcount in five months is quite a chore. It's been executed upon, it's been, it's, it was planned, and it's been executed to a T by the revenue assurance team. So we, I believe, we believe, we are in a very, very good place when it comes to demand fulfillment. But at an aggregate level, to your other question around, will it be a problem for the industry? It is going to be a huge problem for the industry. That's that's how I would characterize it. Sure. Thank you and all the best for the future. Stay safe. Uh, thanks, Manik. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Rahul Jain from Dollar Capital. Please go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, hi. Uh, congrats on uh, great year and uh, great outlook. Uh, just to uh, re uh, reconfirm this, uh, what what is the effective date of uh, acquisition? Is it now certain that it's going to be for 11 months for the year? No, that's correct. Uh, we we the second the second uh, uh, tranche uh, uh, and the consolidation and the purchase of 60% stake got consummated in. Uh, towards the end of April, and it, the consolidation will be for 11 months, as you've noted. And yeah, thanks. And uh, secondly, uh, uh, from a uh, growth in SLK uh, perspective, uh, how sustainable uh, is it growth? We know the past track record has been uh, pretty strong as well. But what part of it could be sensitive to interest rate changes? Part of the exposure that they have to mortgage would be susceptible to interest rate changes. Uh, the firm has grown 17% CAGR over the last three years. We will be very disappointed given the extent of synergies, the fact that we operate in the same industry, if we were not able to materially accelerate that growth curve over the next three years. So, I mean, the way we look at it is we've, uh, we've onboarded a bunch of fantastic SMEs who were already growing at 17% CAGR for the last three years. We walked into the transaction with our eyes open, knowing the segments that they operate across, knowing the fact that we can scale up BPM operations across all our verticals, uh, and knowing the fact that there are material synergies, same industry between tech and operations. So we are going to be very disappointed if we can't take that 17% growth CAGR and not influence it upwards materially. That's how I would uh, that's how I would put it to you, Rahul. Yeah, that's quite encouraging. Thank you. That's it from my side. And best of luck. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you. Anyone who would like to ask a question, you may press star and one. The next question is from the line of Sandeep Shah from Equitas. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, thanks for the opportunity again. Uh, Sudhir, you mentioned that there are two joint bids already been uh, uh, pursued uh, along with the SLK. So can you throw some light? Is it is it the cross-selling or is it the upselling? And uh, uh, do you believe that uh, the top, the 30 clients which they add uh, to your BFSI segment, uh, you will have a ample opportunity in terms of cross-selling and upselling and uh, also selling their services significantly, part of which you have answered in a previous question, but uh, if you can throw some light in this two new joint bids and the uh, other opportunities. Yeah, so uh, I'll give you I'll give you some color that, uh, Sandeep, as you said, uh, the first opportunity of these two is a place where one of the top five SLK global clients where operations work was being done. We've already started conversations with the procurement team. At this point in time, we have access only to operations and procurement there, uh, who have asked us to submit a proposal, not a big proposal, but a material proposal around uh, being considered as a potential technology services partner for them and signing an MSA. So that's one. The second is uh, a conversation that interestingly started off in Europe, which is where SLK Global does not operate, uh, where the CoForge 
sales team has uh, asked them to participate in a solution which earlier on was only being created by the subscale bpm organization that we had uh, to become part of that solution so that we can create a solution and also have the credentials around both tech and operations to try to win it that is a big one uh, so th that those are the two pursuits that uh, the two joint bits that are already in play uh, one of the reasons why we were very excited beyond the five that i talked about during the transit was the fact that this is a firm uh, with a strong north america bfs bias we've 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 i think not penetrated bfs north america to the extent that we think we would like to cross selling both ways is a big part of the synergy and the business case that's been created and uh, we uh, we do think these 30 clients of slk and the clients that we have within the bfs portfolio in north america and in europe are places where cross sell can happen and it must happen Okay, okay. This is helpful. Thanks. Thank you, Sandeep. Thank you. We'll take one last question from the line of Ritesh Rathor from Nippon, India. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah. Uh, hi, Sudhir. Uh, Sudhir, you spoke about 20% employee addition between Jan to uh, May, and you also ensured that attrition won't uh, spike above 10%. Have you built any kind of buffer in your margin guidance to uh, to retain that kind of or to have that kind of retention ratio for the employees? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Clearly, clearly, Ritesh. Um, that's that's part of the that's part of the modeling that we do. Uh, and and if you look at the last two quarters, you would see that we've been interjecting whenever we thought there was a material risk to ensure the attrition numbers do not crawl up uh, at a point like this. Uh, even in quarter four, right? Uh, the margins have come in at eighteen percent. They would have come in higher had we not hired the number of recruiters that we have. If you actually look at the fact sheet that we circulated, you will see that there's about a 36 people addition. Most of those are people from the revenue assurance and the TA function who were hired to make sure that the supply lines keep, don't, 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 uh, don't get squeezed out. So it's been baked in into the, into the uh, forecasting and the planning that they're doing. And maybe on the, on your growth side, if you see uh, for last, three to five years, four years, you have been growing in the range of 18% kind of constant currency. FY21 also keeping us at travel, you, you highlighted 18%. Next year, you are highlighting a similar number. Can next three years, we can be in this kind of growth trajectory? Is there a possibility with the post-pandemic? There are, if there are organizations within our industry, not organizations within industry, within India footprint, who keep clocking more than 20% every year, right? So it is clearly a possibility if we expand our uh, reference set beyond just SIs and firms like us who have India-based operations. So absolutely, it is it is a clear possibility, uh, and it should be something that uh, organizations like us should be aiming for. As I said, my guidance is not 17%. My guidance is at least 17%. This year, when the pandemic hit us in quarter one, in the first investor call, and everybody was understandably trying to write us off because of our travel exposure, I had said in the first call that uh, come what may, this will be a growth year for us. In the second call, second quarter, we were able to give a more firm guidance and we said we will grow at least 5%. In the third quarter, we said we will grow 6%, and fourth quarter, we've delivered on that 6%. So at this point in time, Ritesh, uh, at least 17 is what we feel absolutely sure about offering to, to you and to, to, the other, uh, to the other folks on the call. The intent will be to obviously scale up beyond. And is 20 an impossibility for firms, not just for CoForge, but for firms with an India base? I think the answer should be no. We should be aiming for that over time. Thanks. Thanks for your play. Thank you, Ritesh. Thank you. We'll take one last question from the line of Ashwin Mehta from Ambit Capital. Please go ahead. Hi. Thanks for the opportunity and congrats on good numbers. 
I'm sorry to interrupt you, Mr. Mehta. Your voice is not very clear. May I request you to come on the handset more? Yes, sure. Uh, can you hear me better now? Yes, thank you, sir. Uh, so, Sudhir, just one question uh, in terms of, like, our guidance looks pretty healthy. Uh, the only fact is that uh, our order intake has grown only 4% this year. So, is there a change in terms of the duration of our orders, or do you think, given the pipeline and the deals that we are chasing, uh, we should see a material growth in terms of this order intake as we go forward? So I an order intake, you look at the last three quarters, right, has been centered around 200. Uh, and I, the range, if I recall correctly, is somewhere around 180 to about 200 odd million dollars. Yeah. Any one of these large deal converts, that number can spike and it can spike immediately, right? Uh, if, if I look at our order intake numbers over the last four years, four years back, the number for the year was about 500. This year, it's approaching almost 800. Uh, I think we are at an inflection point where a large deal and, and we we are trying to move away from this definition where 20 million is large deal more towards 50. Any one of them converting should see a material spike. So it's just a question of if and when. And when it does, I think that number will spike. Okay, okay. And uh, just the last one, uh, like we have pretty specialized uh, uh, people on say the Pega side or on the MuleSoft side. We've been expanding on the Salesforce side as well. Now that's a very high growth uh, uh, area for the industry. So in terms of in terms of retention and in terms of uh, the wage hikes, uh, uh, which are which are there, uh, would you think there's a possibility that that war for talent uh, uh, leads to to possible need for any any further intervention as we go into the second half of the next year? So Ashwin, the one thing that we've always prided ourselves on as a management team is that we uh, we operate in the trenches, know what's happening with our people, with our clients, and we bake those in detail into our plans. I, the point that you're making is a very valid point, uh, and I've acknowledged it earlier. There is a war for talent. I think we did see it in advance. We recognize the fact that uh, these are niche, highly skilled, high-cost resources. But we also recognize that these kind of skills should demand, and we do demand, higher rates for them, right? So the margins for these businesses, I do not see them getting depressed just because the cost structure might go up. As cost structure is going up, pricing also is going up. Uh, you, I, I do not see a risk of margin deterioration because of salary corrections to be done. In any case, we've done most of it. Uh, on the 1st of April, we have done two interventions in the last two quarters to make sure that attrition was stable. I do not believe, we do not believe collectively as a leadership team that uh, margins will come under pressure because we have to do salary corrections and that and we will not be able to demand a pricing premium in return if push comes to shove. Okay. That's that's good to hear. Uh, thanks, Sudhir. All the best uh, for the future. Thank you, Ashwin. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that was the last question for today. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Sudhir Singh, CEO, of, for closing comments. Thank you very much. And I uh, very sincerely, very deeply, and very, very personally mean that. I know these are very, very tough times for all of us across the world. And as I said at the outset, particularly for the folks in India, uh, we've always learned from the comments that we get on these calls. We try to act upon the insights that we derive from these calls. And we've always been, we are, and we will always remain very grateful for your presence, for your insights, and for your questions. Please do say, stay safe. And I look forward to speaking with all of you three months from now hopefully at a time where the pandemic isn't raging as it is. Thank you very, very much for your time and for your interest. Good night. Thank you. On behalf of CoForge Limited, that concludes this conference. Thank you for joining us, and you may now disconnect your lines.